All right. Hello, and thank you for joining us today as we kick off the third season of the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Virtual Road Trip. We have a very special series of presentations planned for you over the coming months and are thrilled to begin this year's adventure with the Sam and Alfreda Maloof Foundation for Arts and Crafts. For those of you joining for the very first time, I'd like to share a brief background on this program before we jump into today's presentation. The Historic Artist Homes and Studios Virtual Road Trip is a collaboration between the James Castle House, which is operated by the Boise City Department of Arts and History, and the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program, also referred to as HAWS, which is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. HAWS is a coalition of 55 locations across 25 states that were once the homes and working studios of many American artists. PAUSE aims to preserve the nation's legacy of creativity in the visual arts by connecting visitors with these remarkable spaces. So the James Castle House and Hawes uh, launched this virtual road trip in the summer of 2021, a time when travel was limited due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Longing for adventure, we found inspiration in the recently published Guide to Historic Artist Homes and Studios, written by Valerie Belent, the director of Hawes. With a desire to dig deeper into these extraordinary sites, this virtual road trip was born. So my name is Mackenzie Dunstan and I'll be your guide on this year's virtual road trip. I serve as the education and outreach coordinator at the James Castle House in Boise, Idaho, which is located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock and Northern Paiute people. With me today is Valerie Belent, the director of the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program. Jim Rawrich, uh, the Executive Director of the Sam and Alfreda Maloof Foundation for Arts and Crafts. And providing American Sign Language interpretation is Lavona Andrew Carson. Along with ASL interpretation, English language captions are available by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen, then selecting show subtitle. So live transcript and show subtitle. We strongly encourage your questions and ask that you send them to us via the Q&A box. At the end of this presentation, we will answer as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, we're gonna talk about a lot of cool things. Um, so look for links to related events, resource mailing lists um, uh, at, that we'll share through the chat feature. And please note that this event is being recorded and an, uh, the recording will be available online in the coming days. So because this is a road trip, it only makes sense that we look at a map to chart out this year's virtual journey. Over the next six months, we will travel west to east, visiting with directors, curators, collection managers, and scholars to learn about the following historic artist homes and studio sites. We are, of course, starting with the Sam and Alfreda Malou Foundation for Arts and Crafts in Rancho Cucamonga, California. Then we will visit the Kaus Sharp Historic Site in Taos, New Mexico. After that, we will travel to the T.C. Steele State Historic Site, which is in Nashville, Indiana. Then we'll visit the historic Westwood in Knoxville, Tennessee. Then the Remy and Haim Gross Foundation in New York City. And finally, we'll end our road trip at the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center in East Hampton on Long Island. So each presentation is sure to offer a unique glimpse into the environments and daily lives uh, and creative practices of the artists who once called these places home. So we hope you'll join us for every stop of the way. Now to orient us to the site we're visiting today, I'd like to invite Valerie to share her recommendations when traveling in this area. Thank you, Mackenzie, to you and everyone involved at the James Castle House for spearheading this third year of the virtual road trip in collaboration with Historic Artist Homes and Studios. And I'm thrilled to kick off this season with a place that sets the stage for what will be a through line we'll be exploring this year. Sites which represent the legacies of more than one creative, of live, lives lived together and expanding artistic expression. I first learned about Sam Maloof when I heard him interviewed on an NPR segment. I believe he was in his 90s. But in ensuing years, I have become entranced, as you all will this evening, with the total integration of life and art that marks 
what Sam and his wife, Alfreda, created through their home. I'm also keenly aware that this house is inextricably linked to place relative to the, both the San Gabriel Mountains and Southern California more generally. The couple's longstanding ties to the region were strong, as you will learn from our host tonight, Executive Director Jim Rowich. So given that, I wanna start by orienting us to this immediate area, then venturing out a bit, using Sam and Alfreda's town as the hub to which we will ultimately return. As a former California resident, I have visited several of the locations I'm going to mention in my talk, but in August, I will, I must confess and be honest, will travel to the Malu site for the very, very first time. And so my wish list this evening also highlights places Jim recommended to me that will likely be folded into my upcoming excursion. So we're gonna start our trip in the city of Rancho Cucamonga, of which Alta Loma, the official locale of the Sam and Alfreda Maloof site is a part. Nestled against the backdrop of the foothills of the same San Gabriel range, it's about 37 miles east of downtown Los Angeles. For devotees of roadside attractions along historic Route 66, don't miss a photo op at the 1915 service station, which you see on the upper left. Historic House Museum buffs can visit the John Raines House, a mid 19th century brick home built by predominant businessman and socialite Raines, who is reported to have opened California's first commercial wine winery. And whether that's like a, a folktale or not, I can't be sure. But um, be that as it may, you should embrace that history by visiting any number of the current local wineries, including Joseph Philippi. They have been producing vintages in the Valley for more than 100 years. Local produce, as I learned through living there, throughout California is tremendous, and this region is no exception. So you just have to travel about 15 minutes to Amy's Farm in nearby Ontario. You can take a farm tour or shop seasonal delicacies from avocados to limes to pomegranates to pumpkins, and Amy is an actual real person. The mountains and forests are always within sight. Um, the Ang Angeles National Forest provides opportunities for hikers and campers. Um, feeling a little more adventurous, you can consider actually bungee jumping off of the bridge to nowhere so named as the road to the bridge was washed away long ago in a flood. And area tour companies can facilitate a perfect experience for the ultimate thrill seeker in this environment. Embarking from Rancho Cucamonga, let's travel just over 30 miles along what is known as the Foothills Corridor to one of my um, places that I love to Pasadena. For me, the Maloof property, as you will see later, is an architectural wonder. So it seems only fitting that we spend some of our time in a town lauded as a treasure trove of historic architecture. A must see is the Gamble House, an iconic example of the arts and crafts style executed by the Green Brother Architects. The exquisite front door glass panel depicting a Japanese pine tree is one of numerous Japanese inspired details and collections throughout this um, sumptuous house. Throughout Pasadena though, a wealth of architectural variety awaits. Yes, there are more craftsman bungalows to be sure, but also 1920s Art Deco and Spanish colonial um, inspired storefronts in 1960s buildings, such as the Beckman um, circular auditorium that you see on screen. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. I have actually walked these streets um, times for hours, at least in my head, it was for hours, just marveling at um, the variety um, and, and richness of that architectural heritage. Pasadena Heritage, um, which is an organization, is a great resource to find out more. Uh, they are housed in their own signature building, a former women's club originally built by renowned Chicago-based architect George Washington Mayor for a lumber tycoon, and it too features just incredibly beautifully um, decorative interiors. No trip to this area is complete without a visit to the scrumptious 
Huntington campus, which includes extensive art collections, seemingly endless gardens, and one of the most important research libraries in the nation. The creation of railroad magnate Henry Huntington and wife Arabella and their former Bozar Mans, you could, and I would argue should, spend an entire day here. It's hard though when you're there to know where to start. Outside, there are more than a dozen themed gardens from desert to subtropical to more traditional rows and beyond. Inside, art from all over the world, but perhaps best known, um, they are for Gainsborough's iconic Blue Boy, which you see on the top of the slide, which has been referenced for decades in television and film by everyone from the Muppets to Quentin Tarantino. While I might be a little biased as a former curator of um, Hudson River School artist Frederick Church's home at Olana, a highlight of the collection for me, no surprise, is Church's large masterwork canvas depicting Andean Peak Chimborazo, which you can see at lower left on your screen. While LA is admittedly fairly close to the Malou site, I'm deliberately suggesting some alternative excursions that include other preserved artist homes. First, we're gonna take a slight detour and travel about 30 miles um, outside of uh, the Malou home to Riverside to the historic and sprawling Mission Hotel, a destination location since it first opened in 1907. Its majestic outdoor courtyard complements the soaring interior complete with rotunda, crammed with eclectic art, stained glass, and mysterious passages. You venture here during the winter holidays and the entire extravaganza is lit up and tricked out for the Festival of Lights. Other enticements in town include robust farmer's markets, antiques um, gal gallery, and um, charming bistros. Just under two hours from Riverside, um, going back north, is um, Noah Purifoy's 10-acre artistic environment beckons with large-scale sculpture conduct, uh, constructed entirely of jumped materials. Close by for nature lovers is Joshua Tree National Park. The Purifoy site was accepted into Haas in 2021 and was actually featured in last year's road trip. So you can learn more about this amazing outdoor museum, Joshua, Joshua Tree, and other area attractions in that program's recording, which we're going to put um, as a link in the chat. Now traveling an hour south, Sunnylands, a place I have only just discovered through our host, Jim, which is now on my bucket list. It is the former winter home turned public site of ambassadors and political insiders, Walter and Lenore, Annenberg. Today you can visit their lavish home built by modernist architect A. Quincy Jones and walk the grounds where numerous American presidents, including Barack Obama, English royalty, and other world leaders have been hosted at this locus of international diplomacy, which I knew nothing about. And by the way, Frank Sinatra also got married here. The Glass uh, Facade Visitor Center offers a cafe and ro uh, rotating exhibitions. You can meander through the desert garden or join programs such as outdoor yoga or birding walks. You can book a historic house tour to view the lush interiors featuring this couple's strong impressionist painting and decorative arts collection. So we've already seen some amazing dare I say, elaborate locations with fantastical collections amassed by wealthy patrons. But Southern California also promises sites created by makers like Sam and Alfreda Malou, including several who worked in the decorative arts. 60 miles west, nestled in a hillside in Pacific Palisades, is the modest 1,500 square foot home created by iconic design couple, Ray and Charles Eames. Like at Malouf, this home includes furniture of the couple's design displayed alongside personally collected and dare I say curated art and objects. 70 miles further north in Ojai lies the former home and studio of Dada artist and ceramicist, Beatrice Wood who is quoted as attributing her longevity to art books, 
chocolate, and younger men. Take a tour of her studio, engage in a ceramics workshop, view the rotating exhibitions of contemporary ceramic artists, and then step outside and enjoy the panoramic mountain view. This largely unknown gem of a site is a revelation, and we hope that both these sites will someday become part of the Haas family. Should your trip allow for even more northern destinations in California, I would feel remiss if I did not mention the wonderful Haas site you can discover. From the traditional San Francisco Victorian, transformed by conceptualist David Ireland, to the art colony established by artists and educators Marguerite and Franz Wildenhain, to the arts and crafts home of painter Grace Hudson in Mendocino Valley. All are worthy of pilgrimage. So we've been kind of all over, but now it's time to circle back to Maloof's own neck of the woods, which includes a side trip to nearby Claremont, home to the Claremont Colleges, a consortium of seven schools with adjoining campuses. As we will learn in detail from our host, Jim, it is here where Sam Maloof's artistic exploration began, but also perhaps more importantly, where he met Alfreda specifically at Scripps College, which I believe is pictured on the upper right of your screen. Visiting today, you can completely immerse yourself in Skyscape at the Pomona College campus. At dawn or dusk, this lighting art installation will bathe you in changing color. Beyond the campuses though, enjoy exhibitions at the Claremont Lewis Museum of Art, housed in the historic train depot, among the featured permanent collections, none other than a Sam Maloof rocker. Or visit the Museum of Paleontology. Its founder unearthed his first fossils in 1936 on a collecting trip to the Mojave Desert. Or take some time to visit the Botanical Gardens, which pride um, themselves on a diverse representation of California native plants. Looking for something completely different? Stop by the Folk Music Art Center, learn and shop among instruments from all over the world, and perhaps leave with an Appalachian dulcimer or Celtic harp, whatever you're fancy. If you need some libation after such a long day, stop by the tasting room at Claremont Craft Ales and enjoy weekly special events from trivia to fresh fired pizza night. Having spent time in this place of Maloof's artistic beginnings, we now turn to what is the most expansive and personal creative expression of his life. When I speak about this magical site and truly handmade home to others, I describe it as a visual poem representing the life of mm -hmm. Sam and what the life Sam and Alfreda created here together over many years, room by room, ever evolving. It is simply a magnificent and singular work of art. It eloquently captures what happens at so many art sites where experimentation moves beyond the studio and workshop. The creative idea is made tangible and tactile, but also integrated into daily life. And at this site, something more, the manifestation of a larger life philosophy an entree into these people who we feel we want to come to know. So I thank you, Jim, for sharing this place and these people with us, and to you, Mackenzie, for the collaboration. We we'll look forward to hearing uh, Jim's remarks. But first, <laughs> we'd like to take a start with a special land acknowledgement. Miha, Natwanyane Wallace Cleves. Miha, Natwanyane Moira Cleves. Miha means hello, and Natwanyane means my name is. Tongva Neha, Awesh Koneha, Ekwaaha Tovangar. We are Tongva, and we are glad that you are here with us today, and we wish to welcome you to Tovangar, the Tongva world. The Sam and Alfreda Maloof Foundation for Arts and Crafts acknowledges the Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, the Tongva world, including the Los Angeles Basin, South Channel Islands, San Gabriel and Pomona Valleys, and portions of Orange, San Bernardino, and Riverside counties, and are grateful to have the opportunity to work for the Tarah Taham, Indigenous Peoples, 
In this place, as institutions located on unceded indigenous land, we pay our respects to Hanukvetam, ancestors, Ahiherom, elders, and Evuhinkim, our relatives and relations, past, present, and emerging. Thank you for being with us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Wallace and Moira. That, that's really a terrific way to acknowledge our, our heritage. And uh, I, uh, I have to say, I'm Jim Rawich. I'm the executive director of the Sam and Alfreda Maloof Foundation for Arts and Crafts. And I can't let this moment pass after Valerie's uh, fabulous introduction without noting something that I, I read just within the last couple of weeks, which I think is really wonderful and probably applies to everybody who's watching today. Uh, I, I've read just recently, there's, there's new research that suggests that people who make uh, art and art museums a regular part of their lives um, live on average another seven years longer than, uh, than people who don't. And I think that, uh, uh, after Valerie's introduction of all the art and uh, culture that's available in the vicinity of the Maloof and in Southern California, it's a great place to begin to think that that it also uh, lets, you, lets you live another seven years. And I would say with all of those examples, it may let you live forever. Uh, and, uh, and that's the message that I want to begin our uh, exploration of the, uh, of the Maloof story with. Um, and this, this beautiful picture, this is where I get to work. Uh, the Maloof Historic Home, Workshop, and Discovery Garden, a Smithsonian affiliate museum uh, located in the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains, which were described well by Val. The Maloof Home was begun in 1954 and was completed shortly before Sam's passing in 2009. Of the 50 or so sites identified as part of the Historic Artists' Homes and Studios program, only a small handful were built by the artists who occupied them. Now, when I say built, I'm not describing the way somebody hires an architect and contractors to build a house to live in. I'm talking about how America's most celebrated woodworker used his own hands, his own tools, uh, and his own imagination to create a beautiful place to live with his family uh, while operating what would one day become a world famous woodworking studio. In this photo, you get a sense of the surrounding landscape, six acres of what we call our drought tolerant, water wise discovery garden. At the Maloof, we talk about artful living and share the story of how two talented artists of California's Inland Empire region built lives of creativity and intention. Our institutional uh, mission is to ensure that future generations are inspired by the Maloof experience and the legacy of Sam and Alfreda Maloof. Here's uh, Sam at the front gate of the Maloof house with one of his famous rocking chairs. But the furniture that Sam made is only part of the story. Sam's family traces its roots to the Lebanese village of Duma which was part of Syria before Lebanon was established as its own country. Sam's father was an itinerant merchant who arrived in America speaking only Arabic. In uh, California, he soon learned Spanish to do business with his mostly rural and agricultural customers. In Sam's early years, and you see him there uh, with the uh, orange oval around him, uh, the family lived in a town near the Mexican border and uh, moved north to San Bernardino County when Sam was about four years old. As a kid, Sam doodled and drew and took a wood shop class. Um, in becoming an artist, he was mostly self-taught. And in those days, college was not something that kids like Sam were encouraged to pursue. After high school, Sam, who's there in the middle uh, with his parents, worked as a graphic artist. At one point, he was recruited to join Disney Studios as an animator in training, but Sam's mother worried that her son might lose his way among the fast women of Hollywood. Sam loved to tell that story, so he instead joined the Army. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Sam found himself assigned to the Aleutian Islands, where his skills in photography, art, and drawing served him well. 
in addition to making maps for the placement of guns, he had some more creative assignments like uh, drawing this Italian mascot. Ah, the woman who would one day become Sam's wife also served in World War II. She was Alfreda Ward, born in Pasadena. Her early years were spent nearby in the small town of Laverne, which is one of several foothill communities between Pasadena and Rancho Cucamonga. Here's a range of photos of Alfreda as a young woman at various stages from high school uh, into adulthood. In spite of what was described as a tough home life, she managed to get herself to UCLA where she dreamed of becoming an artist. Because studio art classes required her to pay extra for art materials, which she felt she couldn't afford, she decided on a dual major in art and education. Graduating in the midst of the Great Depression, Alfreda found her first job working for the federal government. This photo was taken during her two years teaching second and third grade at New Mexico's Santo Domingo Pueblo, which I, I think you would agree looks like quite an adventure. She would later transfer to Santa Fe Indian School where she taught and led the arts and crafts department, responsible for a, a staff of 10. There she would connect with a community of Native American artists whose members taught her a great deal about making art and about making your living as an artist. Among Alfreda's mentors was the great American potter, Maria Martinez, whose black on black ceramic works applied traditional materials and techniques to the creation of newly original designs. The Maloof Art Collection in Rancho Cucamonga holds several of Maria's pieces, as well as one small bowl that Alfreda herself made under the direction of Maria, who would become Alfreda's lifelong friend. Alfreda would later transfer to the newly opened Museum of the Plains Indians in Browning, Montana, where she served as an arts and crafts marketing specialist, expanding her experience in the selling of art. Then in 1944, Alfreda joined the US Navy's WAVE program for women volunteers, where part of her time would be spent in occupational therapy, teaching injured servicemen in weaving printing and other crafts, including woodworking. Returning home after the war, now with uh, GI Bill education benefits, Alfreda would finally have the resources she needed to pursue her dreams in studio art. She enrolled at what would become Claremont Graduate University, where she created the painting we see here. Inspired by her time in New Mexico, her art making also reflected the era's evolving modernism. In graduate school, she met a well-known American painter named Millard Sheets, who was chair of the art department at Scripps College. Alfreda would also meet Millard's studio assistant, a promising young artist named Sam Maloof. Sam and Alfreda, Boarded and married in relatively short order. By now, already in their 30s, they were ready to embark on the next phase of their lives, which included a new baby boy. Having worked as a studio assistant, Sam had a uh, close up. Oh, uh, let me uh, uh, say also that uh, um, by 1949, uh, the Maloofs uh, had a baby to care for. That's the photo we're looking at here. And Sam's long hours working in Millard's studio seemed increasingly ill-suited to family life. Alfreda thought they might find a more rewarding path. She suggested they bring their talents together in the founding of a woodworking studio. And the rest, as they say, is history. Having uh, worked as a studio assistant, Sam had a close-up view of how Millard marketed and sold his art. Combined with what Alfreda had learned in Santa Fe, uh, the two already had many of the skills they would need for their success. Sam's name was on the furniture, but Alfreda was always at his side, even as in this picture when her back was to the camera. She was his muse, his manager, and his business partner. 
One day, while still working out of their garage, they received a call from a new client whose arrival on the scene would change their lives forever. He was Henry Dreyfus, one of America's top industrial designers. Dreyfus had designed some of the mid that uh, the mid 20th century's most iconic products, including the original AT&T desk telephone. He also designed a locomotive for the Penn Central Railroad. He designed the Big Ben alarm clock there uh, at the bottom left, Honeywell's ubiquitous round thermostat at the right, and later the Princess Telephone looking beautiful in pink. Long centered in New York, Dreyfus was establishing a West Coast home and studio. He needed furniture for his conference room, and somebody suggested that he call Sam Maloof. Well, for centuries, furniture makers had been creating all kinds of chairs. Dreyfus uh, was a modernist with an early interest in ergonomics. He commissioned Sam to design and build something simple, contemporary, and unique. The basic ingredients, though, would be four legs, a seat, and a back. Sam's design featured natural materials, wood and leather with subtle sculpted lines, unlike those of many traditional chairs. The commission was a lucky break for Sam because now everybody who passed through Dreyfus's West Coast studio would now sit in a chair designed and built by Sam Maloof. Before long, Sam would be counted among the West Coast's new generation of modernist furniture designers. He would be commissioned to make furniture for Hollywood celebrities and one of LA's hottest new hotels, the Beverly Hilton, a modernist icon opened in 1955. Designed by architect Welton Beckett, the hotel had a presidential suite furnished with uh, furniture designed and built by Sam Maloof. Maloof designs were especially welcome in the glass, steel, and concrete residences that characterized LA's mid-century architecture. In addition to making furniture for homes, Sam designed and built furniture for church, synagogue, and corporate clients. The Maloof archive, which is part of our collection, includes more than 500 of Sam's original design drawings in which his ideas took shape. You get a sense from this picture, I think, of how he uh, imagined his, uh, his uh, chair designs. Sam refused mass production and described himself always as a woodworker. Some said that was a reflection of Sam's humility or maybe his lack of confidence in declaring himself to be an artist. Others view it as part of his genius in marketing. In the process, he became known as a leader of America's emerging studio craft movement. Sam's furniture also embodied something of the California lifestyle, which Sam used to promote the Maloof brand. Here he sits in the shade of his favorite avocado tree surrounded by Maloof furniture, which was often photographed in natural surroundings. In this photo, he's pictured with his son Slimen and the branches up above and nephew Nassif leaning casually against the tree trunk. The Maloof historic home displays the world's largest collection of Maloof furniture, including both Sam's first and last rocking chairs. The one shown here is typical of Sam's later rockers with masterful details and joinery few woodworkers could match. When a Maloof rocker was received into the White House art collection, President Ronald Reagan welcomed Sam and Alfreda for a visit. Here's another one of Sam's iconic designs, the Evans chair, a part of the collection at the Smithsonian American Art Museum's Renwick Gallery. Folks who knew Sam in the early days, say uh, at some point making chairs became his day job. He lived increasingly for the weekend when his finely honed skills could be brought to bear on the challenges of building the Maloof's extraordinary home, which is the reason we're here today and what I wanna show you next. It took half a century for the project to be completed uh, with the Maloof family and residents throughout the house was always a work in progress. As the sign suggests here, the house in many ways became, became Sam's most ambitious woodworking project. 
let's see what's inside here. The inner courtyard welcomes visitors into a serene and peaceful space. Alfreda's favorite Japanese maple tree offered shade in the summer and color in the fall there at the left and supplied the seeds that would be used to plant many more maple trees at the site. The house is built of relatively common materials, principally California redwood and Douglas fir, both of which were plentiful and affordable in California in the 1950s and 60s. Here we see the front door. Unlike many modernists, Sam was never one to settle for a flat, unadorned surface. He found beauty in elaboration and in the interplay of light and shadows as the sun moved across a sculpted surface. Entering the house, your eyes are drawn to the cork top table in the foreground and to the light from the windows beyond. Sam would often receive his clients at this table, which was strategically located between the shop and uh, living spaces where clients could experience Maloof furniture firsthand in a domestic setting. The adjacent kitchen wasn't large or luxurious, but note the double ranges there at the left, proof that this was a place for serious nurturing and sustenance. Alfreda frequently prepared meals for Maloof clients, many of whom would become longtime friends of the family. Dinners at the Maloof table were not grand or sumptuous. The most famous of guests might be served Alfreda's chicken casserole. And you can see it here on the table for a family dinner with President Jimmy Carter. Carter uh, is an avid woodworker and shared Sam's passion for beautiful handmade furniture. He also learned a bit from Sam about uh, how to make furniture. When we were preparing for the Maloof Centennial in 2017, I had the good fortune to meet Jimmy Carter. I was especially impressed to hear the president describe Sam, and, and these were his, his words. Uh, he described Sam as a moral philosopher. Um, he also described Sam as one of the most important influences on his life, which I thought was pretty interesting for a woodworker. Over the years, the Carter family ordered four Maloof rockers, including this one in the president's office in Atlanta. In addition to showcasing Sam's furniture, the historic home displays the Maloof's own art collection, which celebrates handmade craft and many works of art acquired over the years from the local artist community. When asked, what kind of art do you collect? Sam usually replied, I collect what I like. For the Maloofs, artful living encompassed the appreciation of creativity in many forms. Here's that same ceramic piece we saw in an earlier photo, the one displayed on the mantel in the living room. Clearly, Sam and Alfreda were attracted to art filled with joy and color, selected with intention and displayed throughout their home with pride. I think the Maloofs weren't much interested in art hierarchies or in sorting art by categories of, is it craft or is it fine sculpture or is it something else? Uh, they knew what they liked and what they liked was beautiful, inspired and almost always reflective of, of an artist's hands at work. This room began as a bedroom, which was later divided down the middle with a curtain, one side for their son and one side for their daughter. In later years, the, re the room became a library. This second floor space is known as the treehouse room with a branch from Sam's beloved avocado tree used at the ridge of the roof. I love how the trees and sky beyond the windows uh, make a relatively small space seem much larger than it is. In the primary bedroom, the bed stands in the middle of the room, surrounded by art. Some of the ceramic creations on display are pre-Columbian, others reflect the modern sensibilities of artists such as Harrison McIntosh or Gertrude and Otto Natzler or, or others. Though Alfreda uh, didn't live to see the house open to the public, her influence is felt throughout. This stained glass window made by Sam marks the entrance to Alfreda's studio. For years, she ran the business from an office near the workshop 
when Sam decided she deserved a, a more welcoming place to work. He created this beautiful space for her and, and you can see the stained glass window above the door over there on the right. When it was uh, completed, Alfreda moved her desk and her filing cabinets into the space. In about six months, she decided she missed her old office, which was located to uh, adjacent to Sam's workshop. And she decided to move back to it uh, where she was closer to the woodworking. Sam uh, took this room back over, uh, added a spiral staircase and filled the room with art. Sam's workspace was beautiful in a different way and very much alive with the energy of making. In his half century working in the shop, Sam would make about 5,000 pieces of furniture. Here in the shaping shop, Sam would sculpt furniture himself and oversee production by a small and loyal team of woodworkers. Larry White, Sam's first full-time employee, was a 19-year-old art student when Sam hired him. Six decades later, Larry serves as resident artist at the Maloof Foundation, teaching workshops that carry forward Sam's commitment to educating future generations of woodworkers. The Sam Maloof woodworker business still operates at the site, now under the ownership of Mike Johnson and his wife, Joanne. Mike joined the studio in 1981 and holds an exclusive license to produce the original Maloof designs, which are still being made. One thing we haven't mentioned is how the Maloof's historic structures were actually relocated to the present site. The original Maloof home and workshop, surrounded by a lemon grove, stood in the path of what would become an interstate highway. Because federal law prohibits the use of highway construction funds in the demolition of cultural treasures, the historic buildings and uh, quite a few trees actually from the original site were moved, then uh, painstakingly reestablished on a similar site nearby. With historic preservation came the establishment of the Sam and Alfreda Maloof Foundation for Arts and Crafts. The historic buildings are listed in the National Register. We're also a Smithsonian affiliate offering museum education and craft learning experiences, both on site and through our Art for Living programs in local schools. Tours of the Maloof Historic Home, in case you want to visit, are led by volunteer docents who carry forward the story of Sam and Alfredo. If you're watching today and interested to know more about becoming a volunteer at the Maloof, we'd love to hear from you. Just go to the Maloof uh, website and uh, get in touch with us. As for scheduling a tour, we're open Fridays and Saturdays with field trips, group tours, special workshops, and tours scheduled for other days of the week too. The Maloof story also extends beyond woodworking with Sam's and Alfreda's work as Sunkist growers. Sunkist has been a national brand for more than a century and it was founded near the Maloof home in Claremont, California. Here you see the site's legacy lemon trees, still growing and now part of what we call our Lemon Grove Gallery. Rotating exhibitions bring to the Lemon Grove works by an array of Southern California sculptors. The Maloof Discovery Garden is also home to more than 350 species of plants with interpretive signage to highlight those harvested by Southern California's Tongva community for use in traditional food, medicine, and weaving. Check the calendar and you may find exhibitions or workshops an artist marketplace or other public events planned during your time in town. If you come to the Maloof in 2023, you can see the exhibition Larry White Equilibrium on view in the Jacobs Education Center Gallery. It's currently out of view, runs through the end of the year. In 2024, we'll be exhibiting Jack Rogers Hopkins, California design maverick. Hopkins uh, was an artist and professor at Cal State San Diego, whose uh, designs and furniture and jewelry uh, are the subject of a recent video and book made possible by the Maloof Foundation. And before the end of the year, in, in November, uh, join us for our annual Mexican Folk Art Weekend event featuring notable artists from Mata Ortiz, Oaxaca, and elsewhere. And don't miss the Maloof store, open year round during public hours featuring books and gifts and works of uh, uh, art by local artists of the Inland Empire. 
And of course, none of it would be here today without the vision of this incomparable couple, Sam and Alfreda Malouf, whose example of artful living inspires us still. Thanks so much for sharing this journey. Uh, we hope you'll all come and see us in person real soon. Thanks. Oh my gosh, Jim, thank you so much for sharing about this incredible site, um, this beautiful couple and, and their story and, and the home that they spent, sounds like over half of a century creating. Um, it's so fun to hear this presentation and to see all these images. Uh, so we're now gonna open this up for Q and A. Um, and I see a couple uh, questions coming through the Q and A box. It keeps sending them in. Um, but I would love to start with my own question first. Um, so it, there's a lot of programming that is happening, um, and I'm curious about um, who helps support this programming. Uh, are your volunteers and docents um, heavily engaged in making that happen? It sounds like you work with the local artist community. Um, how, how does everything occur um who helps <laughs> yeah, well, my, my, my goodness like like many of our uh, historic uh, homes and studios uh, of the Haas program you know we're a nonprofit organization we uh, raise money to support the work that we do uh, we've been uh, lucky to attract uh, grant support from uh, institutions like the California Arts Council and and also uh, philanthropic uh, supporters like the Wingate Foundation and uh, and others we also have uh, uh, you know, a, a member program, people can be supportive of the uh, foundation with annual memberships, uh, which uh, confer certain uh, privileges and visitation like uh, like museums and historic homes uh, in other places. So, um, uh, you know, there's a lot our, of ways, to be, a lot of ways to, yeah. to be engaged and, and be supportive. That's absolutely right. Amazing. Thank you. Um, all right, so a couple of questions. Uh, so when exactly was the house moved um, and were Sam and Alfreda still alive when it happened um, during that move? Yeah, the, the, um, uh, when the highway project uh, was uh, you know, inevitable, uh, they began the planning, they worked on it for years. Sam and Alfreda worked together on the planning of the project uh, and Alfreda was around long enough to have participated in the uh, in the selection of the designated uh, uh, site, the, okay. the location where we wound up. She actually, uh, she passed uh, before the uh, relocation uh, was completed. The relocation took place in uh, uh, 2000, 1999 and 2000 and opened to the public uh, in 2001 at the new site. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, there's a question about uh, essentially access to photos of the house. Um, so especially someone's curious about photos of the beautiful doors and hinges found throughout the home, which I imagine are all handmade or mostly. Yeah, uh, and, and in fact, uh, you know, one of the great uh, features I think of uh, of the Maloof house is Sam's, uh, you know, uh, interest and in investment of his imagination in the creation of latches and door handles and uh, and uh, all the uh, the ways to uh, close a, a door on a cupboard or on a mm -hmm. piece of furniture or on, on, on the house itself. You know, each one is unique and uh, tailored uh, by Sam uh, to create uh, some uh, beautiful additional effect to, uh, you know, from the from the latch on the front door to the uh, latches on Alfreda's studio. They're all uh, they're all unique and uh, each one reflects the imagination of uh, a woodworker uh, with uh, a tremendous ability to uh, realize his imagination in uh, in artful productions. That sounds amazing. I imagine um, when visiting, it could be like a treasure hunt to uh, uh, find all these <laughs> different latches. There's actually a, a great story about the uh, uh, latches when the house was being moved. There, there was a time when the uh, when the building suddenly, uh, you know, was standing empty for a period of time, and somebody said. Oh my God! We haven't thought of that. You know, this building is standing empty. It's a target. People will come in and steal the latches. And so somebody, know. you know, rush rush through the house, uh, uh, Sam, and removed uh, the uh, the latches from all of the um, doors and put them in a box. 
And they only realized uh, after the house had been relocated that they hadn't kept notes about which latch came from which door. Oh, so, no. they, so they handed the box to Sam and said, you, you can figure it out. <laughs> I'm Which guessing he that he did. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, he did indeed. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, someone is wondering about uh, if you could elaborate on the uh, Sam and Alfreda's philosophy of um, artful living, um, just telling a little bit more about that, what that means I or what that meant to them. I, I think what it means to us is, uh, you know, they, they, uh, uh, they offer an example of how to live with a kind of uh, uh, creativity and intention as a part of your uh, full life. And, and I think one of the things that I loved about uh, Valerie's um, introduction and, and placing us in the context of other uh, Southern California, you know, cultural treasures of one sort and another, the Gamble House, the Huntington, the, uh, the Mission Inn, often museums reflect a kind of uh, collector mentality where somebody of considerable means, you know, scours the world, yeah. Henry Huntington brings back beautiful stuff and puts it all together in a house and says, look at all the beautiful stuff I collected. The thing that you get with a uh, with a historic home where an artist actually lived is instead of, uh, uh, you know, the the object is not necessarily to just collect beautiful things. The object is to have a beautiful life. And, yeah. and we kind of summarize that under the headline of the artful living idea of you can live a beautiful life. You know, you you make choices, you uh, you choose the place that you live, you choose how you live, uh, and, um, uh, you know, finding that way of how to do it um, while making art is also part of the challenge and part of the example, and I think part of the uh, the joy in visiting a place like um, Maloof. And I think that there, there's also, uh, you know, there's this sense of um, that thing I started with, of, of talking about how uh, art, um, you know, gives life and extends uh, uh, you know, how how long we live and, uh, you know, that those experiences of joy and discovery and yeah. uh, aesthetic pleasure, uh, uh, you know, actually make us healthy and well. And uh, and that for us, I think, is all encompassed within the idea of artful living. And, you know, uh, art museums and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, art uh, uh, learning centers and so forth, uh, um, most of the people that we see are not going to become artists themselves, but we would advocate for um, engagement, creative, in artful lives. Yeah. Everybody, you know, the definition of being a human being has to do with being a, a creative problem solver. And, uh, and the idea that uh, there are places that stand as evidence of, uh, of people's engagement in being able to create beautiful lives for themselves offer us all an example to inspire, uh, you know, our own choices. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for elaborating on, on this larger philosophy and hope for especially your visitors. Um, there is a question about uh, if the Maloof children uh, continue their had creative practices of their own, um, if art ran in the family in that way. Uh, uh, it's a very creative family. I mean, uh, some of that uh, is traceable back to uh, Lebanon. We know that the village of Duma is uh, known uh, in uh, Syria and, and later Lebanon as a, uh, as a source of great uh, creativity and art making. And in fact, uh, uh, the Maloof children uh, and grandchildren have gone on to, uh, to have various uh, kinds of creative lives. Uh, Sly Men was, the, the son was very much involved in Sam's uh, woodworking uh, uh, enterprise for, for many, many years. Uh, and we know that his uh, grandchildren and his, his granddaughter in particular is a, a quite uh, a successful musician. So. Um, these things, uh, these things tend to run in families, and we, we don't know whether they run in families by uh, genetic association or by example. But in, in any event, uh, there uh, there's certainly uh, lots of uh, lots of evidence that uh, one thing leads to another. Absolutely, I imagine that being um, surrounded by such creativity and the um, ability to just make whatever you want from materials around you certainly was contagious um, in, a, in a family like this. Amazing. Um, I, I think that that's right. You know, uh, and, and to that point, one of the things that, that I think you see in, a, uh, in the Maloof, in a visit to the Maloof, Sam was, uh, Sam loved ceramics and collected a lot of ceramics. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of examples of uh, uh, contemporary 20th century ceramics uh, in the house. And one of the interesting uh, uh, examples of cross-pollination in art making comes from the 
comparison of some of the ceramic examples to some of the woodworking examples, because Sam very clearly uh, sees in uh, the making of ceramics a way of being able to shape and mold uh, a clay in ways that then he he replicates in uh, in woodworking, with, with woodworking and, yeah. and, and needless to say it's uh, in in some ways it's much easier to uh, shape something uh, uh, in um, uh, in clay than it is in wood and Sam I think took that as a challenge often to try to uh, replicate what could be achieved with a highly uh, plastic moldable material uh, and to achieve it in wood uh, certainly gave um, his uh, his furniture um, a, a surprising kind of sensual uh, aspect that was uh, unusual in its day and probably unusual still. That's amazing. So I guess follow up question on that. Did he um, did he do some ceramics as part of kind of his exploratory practice or was it all woodworking all the time? You know, I think uh, I think once he started, uh, he, he was quite an accomplished artist uh, and did lots of different kinds of art. And, and you see the art, uh, you see various examples of the art mm -hmm. kind of sporadically through the uh, uh, through the collection. He he didn't. Uh, I'm not aware of any ceramic work that he did. We mentioned in the program that Alfreda had some uh, background in ceramics. Yes. Sam did love ceramics uh, and collected a lot. Uh, and uh, and and, you know, um, uh, the Claremont Colleges and the surrounding artistic community was a uh, was a hotbed of uh, innovative uh, uh, ceramic experimentation and design and uh, and and I think it was just kind of a natural uh, attraction for uh, for Sam. Awesome, thank you for for clarifying. Um, okay, Valerie, this is actually a question for you that just came through. Um, <laughs> There was uh, a lot of love for all your recommendations, which I think I've added just about everything you mentioned in the chat, um, but just curiosity on um, on how you find these spaces to visit. You were you lived in California for some time, correct? So I did. I lived in Northern California, but I also um, have family and friends throughout, basically from all the way up in Nevada City, all the way down past San Diego. And I think um, what I what I often think about, and I and I want to throw some love out to Jim because they're often often um, they're a, the the people who live in these places are a jumping off point for me to think about what they value and think about in terms of being the people who live and 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 work there, and then I just start. Um, I just, I mean, I, I'm embarrassed to say, I just, if I haven't been there directly, although I have, I've spent time in Pasadena and I've been to some other places, but um, I haven't always been to um, some of the surrounding places I might talk about in a road trip. And I just start looking and I just start looking about what I want to do. I could be in a museum probably every day, all day, <laughs> exhibitions yeah. like eight hours a day. But I also find these sort of quirky things interesting and part of the fabric of what make up true cultural legacy in this country. So it's why I always, I don't always give, I don't, I'm, I'm searching for the, you know, when something's of the highest order, I mean, the Gamble House is an amazing place. It's, it's amazing. The Huntington is an amazing place. But at the same time, I want, I always try to juxtapose it with like the quirky or unexpected or what I would want to do. I like to go find local wineries and food. And so it's really an expression of just kind of, it's very genuine. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> what, what I like want to do. We're on a webinar, so I never see anyone else on these. So I'm always like, is that actually resonating, or or you know, because I know I it's different if I was live in a room, but I I do just start looking around if I haven't physically been to um every place, and I also see this a little bit as a part of a discovery for me, even if mm. I have been. There's some sites I've been to many, many times. And so I'm very familiar with the surrounding area. And so I almost um, make it a task for myself to find something new because frankly, there's always something new and yeah. there are always great connections. And I didn't even go to Aspen, which I could have gone because what I could also tell you is that when we talk about ceramics, 
Um, Sam Maloof and Paul Soldner, these couples were friendly. And there is Maloof furniture in the Soldner site, which came into Haas last year. And there are Soldner ceramics. And I think what I just want to <coughs> say briefly relative to Jim's point mm -hmm. is it's also about, uh, for me, when we talk about that artful life is that there isn't a barrier. It isn't, it is, it's permeable all the time, which is beauty, surface, looking at nature, all of these things contribute. You don't have to designate specific time. And artists typically don't designate specific time because they're artists even when they close the studio door. So it's surrounding yourself with stimulus. And I also always think relative to the question about whether is it nature or nurture. Mm. Um, I think that we're not all gonna be as talented as Maloof, no matter how much maybe we would apply ourselves. I think that's real, but um, we all have creativity within us and most of us suppress it. Um, and and I think when you go into a place that's so handmade, like the Maloof site or the Escherich site or some of the other sites we feature, um, you tap into that because no one taught Sam how to build a house. He just decided just it to out. build a house. <laughs> Which means you could just decide that maybe like you want to play the trumpet tomorrow and see if that brings you creative joy. But I appreciate the shout out because I, I it's fun for me to find things and I hope that people actually go and check them out and make it maybe part of the visit that they embark on. So thank you for that. Absolutely. It means a lot to me. Yeah, I, I I personally always love the recommendations when when traveling. It's so fun to see um, if you're going to go visit a space, really visit it, right? There's a lot to explore. Okay, a slight pivot back to you, Jim. Um, and I think this might be the last question for today before we wrap up. Um, but there was some curiosity about the piece of uh, pottery that Alfreda did under Maria Martinez, if it was a black on black work or if it was in a different style. Yes. Yes, yes, it was. It's it's a it's a quite modest uh, bowl. It's it's on display uh, in the uh, in the Maloof house. Uh, we have uh, you know some examples of uh, Maria's work, which is you know larger and, and more impressive. But what's what we find really uh, kind of wonderful about this piece that Alfreda made was that it was made you know under the guidance of a of a great a potter by a relatively yeah. young. Uh, you know, a young artist experimenting with materials and glazes and and handling and shaping and and all that kind of stuff. And I think that you know one of the one of the great messages of a of seeing art in the context of its creators, you get a sense of that art isn't just about an object taken out of its context and uh, and viewed and admired for its uh, for its characteristics on its own, but you see it in the context that it was created and. And you you view it in the context of uh, natural elements. Uh, you know when you when you see uh, clay shaped like something, you also think about you know the mountains that the clay comes from and the sun yeah. that dries the clay and 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 you know so so there's certainly uh, that connection to it, which I think um, makes for a uh, a, a richer appreciation. Uh, you know, um, in the context of the artist's life. You you uh, understand more about the evolution of work, uh, and and certainly in a place like the Maloof, where we have this you know the the first rocking chair and the last rocking chair, uh, due to the generosity of the of the folks who you know purchased that chair that that original uh, uh, rocking chair in uh, uh, in 1963 and and then donated it back to the foundation. We have that first rocking chair, and we have the story that goes with it, and we have the letter in which the idea of Sam making a rocking chair was hatched. And we have Henry Dreyfus's communication around uh, uh, making a presidential rocker for, uh, for John Kennedy, which uh, never came to fruition, but that was always a dream of Sam's. And you see this seed planted in the early 1960s that gets carried through uh, to the 1980s. And, and you see uh, Sam and Alfreda standing with you know, President Ronald Reagan in the White House, and, and you see, ah, this is this is really how ideas grow and uh, how seeds get planted, how uh, people become passionate about uh, notions that they pursue with 
uh, with energy and enthusiasm over a long period of time. And, and, and then you plot your own life in relation to those uh, to the sorts of currents and, uh, and trends. And you think, you know, if I did something with as much uh, love and passion and, uh, and uh, attention uh, as almost any artist that I admire, I would be in a different place tomorrow than I am today. And I would be in yeah. a different place the day after. And I think that um, so much of our lives have, have been flattened, uh, you know, experience has been flattened and we don't necessarily get to see the, the trajectory of life experience over um, longer periods that visiting some of these uh, artists' homes uh, becomes a way to understand something really fundamental about what it is to be alive and what it is to, uh, to grow and to learn and to have new ideas and to throw them away and to try a new idea. And this is what artists do every single day. You know, every single day in the studio, you're making choices and, and, and you're, uh, you know, becoming deeply involved in the process of turning one thing into another thing. Well, what is that but the story of, uh, of every day of your life? You, you wake up and the day is yours and you get to decide what you do from beginning to end. And, whether you're going to be someplace different at the end of the day than than at the beginning of the day, and clearly I get quite uh, energized around this idea because I yeah. I I take the inspiration of the artists. I'm not an artist, uh, but I sure can appreciate artists, and I sure can appreciate the the journey, and I sure can appreciate uh, you know uh, that uh, the the act of uh, creating solutions to problems is the human experience. That's what differentiates us from uh, so many other species on the face of the earth. And if we're not engaged in that process with, uh, with joy and energy and, uh, and excitement, um, we'll just stay where we are. I, I think the, the challenge for us is all to kind of take that on and, and, um, uh, and find real satisfaction from it. Yeah, that's really powerful, Jim. I think uh, visiting spaces, uh, especially, you know, an artist's home, especially a hand-built home, you get a sense of that very tangibly. Um, and that can be very, very powerful. Um, whether you are an artist or just someone who enjoys creativity in whatever form that takes. If I could say one more thing about that. <laughs> And I think yeah. that this is important uh, in relation to some of what uh, Valerie was also talking about. One of the things that I think is really important for people to understand, people who are not from California, I, I happen to be a native Californian. I've spent almost my whole life in California and California is a place that's special for a lot of reasons, but I think it's also uh, represented in lots of ways that um, people don't necessarily associate, uh, you know, yeah. the work that you find at the, uh, at the Maloof house with the, uh, culture and uh, impact uh, and influence that they associate with Southern California. You know, there are, you know, you think of Disneyland, you think of, uh, you know, movie studios, you think of all sorts of iconic cultural uh, aspects to For life sure. in California. And and in fact, there's also this whole other layer, you know, you go to Noah Purifoy's house out there uh, near, near Joshua Tree and you realize, oh my gosh, you know, it's, yeah. it's kind of mind blowing to realize uh, that that a a land that uh, received you know immigrants from lots of places and and received uh, energy from lots of places everybody uh, you know came from somewhere else except for our uh, our Tongva friends uh, and and even they thousands and thousands of years ago came from someplace else we all bring uh, you know we bring our energy and, and our gifts to bear on the lives that we live uh, and uh, and to that extent I think. Um, you know, discovering some of the offbeat places, which I think some of which uh, uh, Valerie has mentioned, it's a way of understanding um, uh, more than what someone is trying to sell you as a as a tourism experience. You know, it's a way of discovering something about yourself and your family and your roots and your, uh, you know, and your potential, which I think, uh, uh, you know, California um, uh, in its, you know, sort of reputation of being available to new ideas and being open to new ideas. It's, it's a wonderful place to visit and discover um, alternative ways of thinking about how you organize your life and what kind of experiences uh, you prioritize. So uh, enough for you. me. I love it. No, it's amazing. I, I don't know how I close this out from there. <laughs> But um, I guess I'll start by saying thank you so much. Thank you, Jim, for your expertise, for sharing 
these stories and sharing all these thoughts and answering these questions today. Um, I also want to give a special shout out to your colleague, Melanie, who was instrumental behind the scenes for this presentation. Thank you so much to her and her family um, for their contributions. And Valerie, of course, thank you so much for, for being a partner in this incredible program and always sharing um, your time and energy with us. Um, for those of you that are still lingering here in the chat, um, I have shared uh, events, uh, re event resources mailing list, uh, and all of uh, Valerie's recommendations that she mentioned today in the chat. Um, so please take a look at that um, if you are curious about any of those things. Um, we are going to continue this virtual road trip next month, um, where we will explore the creative spaces of longtime friends um, and, and both incredible painters, um, i.e. Kaus and J.H. Sharp in Taos, New Mexico. As a reminder, uh, this recording, or excuse me, this uh, presentation is recorded um, and will be available online here in the next week. Uh, and of course you can find this and all the past road trips, which they are incredible. Um, several of the artists mentioned today um, were past road trip uh, stops. So if you are curious, please check out those videos, uh, which are on the James Castle House YouTube channel. And of course we would love to hear from you. So if you have any additional questions, comments uh, or feedback, please uh, share that uh, with us. Um, I believe there are ways to contact us through these links in the chat. Um, so I guess with that, as sad as I am to say it, I guess we're going to no, say thank thanks. you, Jim. You just, yeah, Jim, yeah. you have embodied <laughs> what Historic Artist Homes and Studios is all about. I mean, this oh. is, that is, thank you for what was just a really inspiring presentation and for volunteering your time. And, and it doesn't happen without you. So thank you. And thank you to Mackenzie. And thank you, Lavona. I you, never Lavona. get to say thank you because I never take us out. So I'll, I'll say, for the entire season. Thank you, Lamona. Thank you, Mackenzie. And of course, thank you, Jim. All right. Well, until next time, see you then. Bye. Bye.